verses that he quotes all the time, and that is to um, prove all things and hold fast that which is good, or test all things. And we are reminded that we are to test all things by what God has instructed us here in this book. Um, but there are times with cultural differences where sometimes it's maybe not as clear. So I would think that we should fall to Corinthians 13 where we have an attitude of love and acceptance and not being judgmental and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives for issues that we may have that create a stumbling block for someone else because of our cultural tendencies and uh, the same with others. So thank you for uh, the study this morning. That concludes our Bible study time and we will now have a prayer which will uh, dismiss for our five minute intermission. Those of you that remain in the sanctuary, we will continue the lineage series. So let's go ahead and bow our heads for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we know that the enemy is the author of confusion and he can often use our, our family or cultural differences to create um, dissension and grief uh, amongst the believers. And I pray, Lord, that we will not fall uh, prey to his snare, that we will keep our eyes on Jesus and that we will all come closer to you. We will draw closer to one another in the meantime. So guide us and direct us through your Holy Spirit and pray that we will be faithful as you are faithful to us. And it's through your son, Jesus, we can claim this promise. Amen. Magna Carta was signed just over 800 years ago here in Runnymede, a document that would have both civil and religious importance for England and also for the whole world. The backdrop to the signing of the Magna Carta was the growing tension between the King of England and the Pope over who had the authority to appoint the bishops of London and Canterbury. At that time, the King of England, King John, was probably one of our weaker kings. The Pope at that time, Pope Innocent III, was probably one of the stronger popes. And in this battle, the Pope eventually won. Because the king was unable to count on the support of the barons because he had conflict with them, he eventually surrendered to the papal legate in 1213, even laying his crown down at the feet in an act of submission. He also agreed to pay 1,000 marks per year and that should any of his successors break that agreement, they would lose all authority in the realm. England was humiliated. The barons were stung into action. They would never be slaves to the Pope. The issue of national sovereignty and the exchanging of money for spiritual benefits was at stake. They feared, and rightly so, 
that this could be one step in a course of events that would lead the Pope to setting up who he wanted to on the English throne, overreaching his authority into national matters. These were some of the main reasons why Magna Carta was signed on the 15th of June 1215. The first clause stated, the Church of England shall be free and hold her rights entire and her liberties inviolate. This issue would rumble on for the next 150 years and the money due to be paid to Rome lapsed over time and became sporadic. This was one of the main reasons of John Wycliffe's early disagreements with Rome. Another key aspect of the Magna Carta was the basis of law that it set up. That the king and the lawmakers were subject to the same law that they themselves wrote. That those accused were granted the right to be tried by a jury of their peers. These, among many other clauses, form the basis of law and justice as we know it today. Many of the principles of Magna Carta form the basis of the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights in America. In fact, this monument here was paid for by the ABA, the American Bar Association. Today, there are four remaining original copies of the Magna Carta. One in the Lincoln Castle, one in St. Mary's Cathedral in Salisbury, and two in the British Library. The principles of Magna Carta, which live on today, stand to us as a testament that we should cherish our civil liberties, that we should protect our civil liberties, and that we should use the time that we have now in the spreading of the gospel while we have the ability to do so.
morning. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Good morning and happy Sabbath to you all. How are you this morning? Well, we are very thankful for the grace that we receive every day of our lives because without grace, we will be nothing. We won't be able to continue with our faith. Now, our hymn for today is hymn number 109, verses 1 and 3, Marvelous Grace. on page 614 uh, one moment sound the battle cry hymn number uh, verses 1 and 3 Thank you, thank you. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. 
to those of you who are here, brave the weather, and are among us to worship this morning. Now, I'm hoping this thing's going to allow us to speak. Colin is um, pulling his hair out back there, trying to make sure there's no cracks and pops, pops and crackles. So if that happens, please uh, bear with us as we are almost ready to replace the system, aren't we? We're getting very close now, so it should work a lot better. So yeah, welcome again. Um, as far as announcements, the first, first announcement that I want to go through is we still have time to do the surveys. And I wanted to ask if there's anyone this morning who still wants a hard copy. And I want to ask uh, someone to pass them out to those who need one so that you can fill it out and by the time the offering plate comes around, you can fold it up and drop it in there and then they will give them to George. So uh, George is wanting to go through those and get them compiled this next week as we have a, a special board meeting coming up next Monday, I believe. And to talk. is it Sunday? That is Monday night. Sunday is the constituency meeting. We will want to do a report from the constituency as well. Okay, Sunday is Sunday the twenty. Is it the third? Is the business meeting? Is that constituent meeting? And then the twenty-fourth evening of the twenty-fourth, the board is meeting with Elder. How do you say that? Rojos. Rojos. Go on with our worship.
Thank you. Our scripture reading this morning is from Titus 3, verse 4. Titus 3, verse 4. And I will be reading from the New King James. Titus 3, verse 4. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. For those who are able, if you would kneel as we have our morning prayer. you've blessed this week of the things you've orchestrated for us that happen in just such a way that only you could do we thank you for that and we think of praise as maybe someone doing a good job well you sure do a good job and we just want to acknowledge that and we would like to be at least half as faithful as you are father we just want to thank you for that altar of sacrifice that we can come to and lay those things down that are between us. And we want to avail ourselves of it so that we can go forward hand in hand with you. Lord, I think of the, the things that uh, we encounter every day that we face and we have to deal with, and I think of how desperately we need the Holy Spirit in our hearts to do that. This morning, Father, we would like for you to send the Holy Spirit to put that special filter in our ears that we may hear just the right message, and that you would bring the call from your altar and anoint George's lips as he speaks to us and that you would be with us as he opens the word and brings it to us. And Father, there's many that are not here. I just pray that you'd be with them wherever they are. There are those that are struggling with health. Father, put your hand on them. And there's many names that we can lift up, and I know there's many names on the hearts of the congregation. So I just want to lift these things up. 
And thank you that even though it rains, there's sun above the clouds. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen. children's story this morning? Petronella's name is on, but I don't see her. Does anybody have one? You have one, Mary? Sure. We're all God's children. We'd love a story. Thank you, Mary. A visitor? You, oh, yeah, brother. two visitors? Here, let me move my phone. You want to sit by your brother? Okay, can you scoot down a little bit? Okay, thank you. I'm getting well, I don't pitch hit very often, but I was talking with a friend this week and we were talking about children's stories. I said, oh, I'm, I'm always in need of some ideas. And so, I think God knew that I needed to step in here today. So here we go. Now normally I would like a real flashlight. You know, the kind with the great big batteries. All kids love flashlights, right? Well, I, I would really like a great big one today that has these big chunky batteries that go in it. But thanks to all the friends here in the church this morning, we're going to make do. Now, sometimes when you put the batteries in a flashlight, you may not put them in quite right. And you go to turn the 
flashlight on and no light comes out. So you rearrange them different ways and how can I make this flashlight work? And then I, you realize that there's a flat side and there's a bump. And a flat side and a bump. And in order to make that flashlight work, the energy has to flow from one into the other, right? And so you put flat, bump, flat, bump. And then you have light. Oh, I don't mean to shine that right in your eye. And you know, it's kind of like, what's our source of energy? You know, if we read our Bibles and we talk to Jesus and we pray, is that kind of a source of energy for us? It helps us to keep connected and to live a good life and do right things. But if we don't talk to Jesus, it's kind of like these batteries. The light won't come on because we're not connected properly. So that's my story for you today is to remember to say your prayers, talk to Jesus, ask for forgiveness, ask Jesus to help you be the best person you can be, and to love your mom and your dad and to obey. Those are the kinds of lessons we all need to remember in life, don't we, right? So, Michael, can you end our little story today with just a prayer to say, Jesus, help me to be the best boy I can be and to keep connected? Okay. You want to do that? Close your eyes. Amen. Okay. You may go back to your seats and remember the flashlight and the batteries, okay? I do appreciate that, Mary, being a minute woman. Um, the uh, funds, the loose, the loose funds in the plate this morning will go for the um, local church funds. Any other, if you wish to donate to any other, please use an envelope and mark it so. And don't forget your name. And if you do not have your surveys, those of you who filled out surveys, if you don't have them ready, uh, you can still slip them to George as, uh, at the end of the service or uh, give them to one of us elders and we'll get them to him as well. So if the, if the ushers would come forward for prayer. Heavenly Father, as you have blessed us, we want to be faithful to you and return these tithes and, and offerings. And we want to ask that you would take these monies and that you would further them like the fish and the loaves that you, you did more than once. And we just thank you for your abilities through our weakness. In Jesus' name, amen.
music, Brian is going to share his voice with us. Thank you, Brian. Good morning and happy Sabbath. You know, the Lord created us in His image. And uh, I'm a sinner, and we all make mistakes. And uh, this song I'd like to sing is you know, even though we're battered with sin and we're all scarred up. And maybe we drift from the Lord, but when we come back, He doesn't throw us away. You know, He still He still wants to work with us. And uh, in this song, it says, "A vessel of honor that I am today." I'm not saying that I'm a vessel of honor, but that is what God can do for each and every one of us if we are just willing to work with him.
but you just kept right on going. That was good. Well, um, this morning I want to welcome George Anderson back to our pulpit, and I don't know if there is ever a formal announcement made, but George did agree to be our head elder for these this next term here a while back. So I just want to ask that each one of you would keep him in your prayers and lift him up as he has all these added responsibilities. And I have to say hats off to him. We're very grateful that he agreed to do it. George, thank you. Thank you very much, Luke. And thank you, Brian. It, uh, it's always um, disconcerting when things don't go the way you expect them to, and there's a moment of panic. So uh, I know how that goes. <laughs> and thank you for persevering. And thank you, Mary, for uh, stepping in with the children's story at the last minute. It was very nice. Thank you. In January, church was canceled due to what was, for St. Louis, a major snowfall. We had had as much snow in 24 hours as we had had in the previous year. So Helen and I listened to the service at Loma Linda University Church. Randy Roberts, the senior pastor, spoke on grace. It is a large topic. He intended to spend several weeks exploring it. So I picked a small corner to talk about today. Randy Roberts' text was taken from Titus, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. Paul reminds Titus, and by extension us, that at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. There is a phrase used in diplomatic circles that describes just that type of person, persona non grata, which translates from the Latin, a person without grace. We use that phrase in everyday language as well. It is used to describe someone that we really don't want around. A person that makes life difficult and unhappy. A person we can't trust in relationships. It seems like just that type of person is described here. Worse yet, Paul is saying that he, Titus, and by extension we start from that same place. But, and this is important, he doesn't leave it there. In the next verse, Paul writes, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And this is the important part. This is grace. It isn't something that we earn. It is a gift. And if we receive it, it can be transforming. It is a wonder drug that cures us and allows us to move from being a person without grace to being a person with grace, a gracious person, a trustworthy person. Paul goes on to describe this transformation and the amazing result. God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified or set right by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is the cure. This is how we become safe to save. And this is the, and this is the promise that we have if we accept God's grace, a gift we don't earn, a gift we just need to graciously accept. Paul ends this passage by emphasizing this is a trustworthy saying. And I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Put another way, this is something that Titus was to emphasize as he led the church in Crete. We could spend the entire time on these few verses, as, as Randy Roberts did. 
and you might consider them for further study on your own. But with the rest of my time this morning, I want to examine one small facet of this that caught my attention. So I decided to delve deeper. What is the relationship between grace and freedom? I found scholars throughout history that have addressed this. It is, it is addressed extensively in the Bible. In fact, I would submit that the entire history of the Old Testament is an exercise in what happened when God created beings and gave them freedom. Freedom to accept him and freedom to turn away as Lucifer did. I think it is instructive to think about how God has, han has handled or dealt with rebellion. I conclude that he has been very muted in his using, use of force as a response. Lucifer was cast out of heaven and became Satan, but he was not destroyed. He was exiled to this earth, but he could only approach Adam and Eve at one tree in the center of the garden. Adam and Eve were warned to be careful about approaching that tree, but they were not forbidden to approach it. Milton puts it this way in Paradise Lost, Book 3. I made him just and right, sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Such I created all ethereal powers and spirits, both them who stood and them who failed. Freely they stood who stood and fell who fell. The point is, Adam and Eve chose to believe the lie and rebel against what God had commanded. They made the choice, but rather than destroy them there and then, God offered hope. He offered a way back. Again, in the words of Milton, as my eternal purpose hath decreed, man shall not quite be lost, but saved who will, yet not of will in him, but grace in me, freely vouchsafed. Later, when the whole earthly world seemed to have rebelled, and with the whole universe watching, we read how God reset what was playing out on this earth with a flood that destroyed all but a very small handful, Noah, who had not turned away together with his family. However, that did not solve the problem. The descendants of those few ultimately largely turned away. God then came down himself as the Son of God, as Jesus, and lived among us. He was largely rejected at the time, but the whole universe saw what had happened. They saw the people that should have been God's own, the chosen, condemn and demand Jesus' crucifixion. And they saw the death that God had warned about all the way back in the garden. For the first time, they witnessed the foretold death as God the Father abandoned God the Son in human form. They saw firsthand what was pictured in the book of Hosea when God wept, saying, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? This is what Solomon wrote of in Proverbs 1, 20 to 33, and what Isaiah wrote about in chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, which is the song of the vineyard. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge me between me and my vineyard. 
what more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland neither pruned nor cultivated and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel and the people of Judah are the vines that he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed, and for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. The unfallen universe had seen enough, and finally Jerusalem was left desolate, both spiritually and physically. What does this have to do with freedom? Paul makes it clear in various places, but specifically in Galatians 5, 13 to 15, where he says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature, rather serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. He then goes on to exhort the Galatians to walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And then he ends with the exhortation, but the fruits of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. One way to look at this, and I believe the way Paul does, is to point out that we are free to do what we want, but we need to use that freedom wisely. This view, I believe, is supported by early church writings. However, the church became, it seems, very troubled by the notion of what they called predestination and reprobation. That is, those who were predestined to be saved and those who were reprobated to be lost. They were troubled specifically by the verse in Malachi, yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I hated, which is quoted by Paul in Romans 3. Just as, it is, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. How do we reconcile this? Are we truly then free to make our choice? Does our choice matter? How could a loving God hate anyone? Did the church change its view of God, freedom, and grace? What guidance was provided by early church leaders? Augustine of Hippo, born in 354, reconciled it this way. He wrote that each man, being derived from a condemned stock, is first of all born of Adam, evil, and carnal, and becomes good and spiritual only afterwards, when he is grafted into Christ by regeneration. So it was in the human race as a whole. When these two cities began to run their course by a series of deaths and births, the citizen of this world was the firstborn, and after him the stranger in this world, the citizen of the city of God, predestined by grace, elected by grace, by grace a stranger below, and by grace a citizen above. Thomas Aquinas, born around 1225, responded in this series of three replies to the question. 
God loves all men and all creatures in so far as he wishes them all some good, but he does not wish every good to them all. So far, therefore, as he does not wish this particular good, namely eternal life, he is said to hate or reprobate them. Reply two. Reprobation differs in its causality from predestination. This latter is the cause of both what is expected in the future life by the predestined, namely glory, and what is received in this life, namely grace. Reprobation, however, is not the cause of what is in the present, namely sin, but it is the cause of abandonment by, by God, what Jesus experienced on the cross. It is the cause, however, of what is assigned in the future, namely eternal punishment. But guilt proceeds from the free choice of the person who is reprobated and deserted by grace. In this way, the word of the prophet is true, namely, destruction is thy own, O Israel. Reply three. Reprobation by God does not take away anything from the power of the person reprobated. Hence, when it is said that the reprobated cannot obtain grace, this must not be understood as implying absolute impossibility, but only conditional impossibility, as was said above, that the predestined must necessarily be saved, yet by a conditional necessity, which does not do away with liberty of choice. Hence, although anyone reprobated by God cannot acquire grace, nevertheless, he falls into this or that particular sin and it comes from his free choice. And so it is rightly imputed to him as guilt. By the time we get to the Reformation a few centuries later, unfortunately things get cloudier. There is a well-documented exchange between the philosopher Erasmus and Martin Luther. Erasmus believed that the church needed reformation, but thought that Luther had gone too far. There isn't time this morning to go into this in detail. Suffice it to say that Calvin, a leader of the Protestant Reformation, took Luther's view, a narrower view, that harkens back to Augustine, but takes a different direction than that taken by Aquinas. It is a view that we see in the Puritans, a view that influenced religion in what was to become the United States. Calvin wrote, those who ascribe our willing effectually to the primary grace of God seem conversely to insinuate that the soul has in itself a power of aspiring to good, though a power too feeble to rise to solid affection or active endeavor. Who has this struggle in himself, save those who, regenerated by the Spirit of God, bear about them with the remains of the flesh? Hmm. What's one to make of this? What has happened to grace and freedom? I found a counterpoint in early United States history and of all places, John Stuart Mill writing in on liberty, representative government, and utilitarianism. According to Calvin, the one great offense of man is self-will. All the good of which humanity is capable is comprised in obedience. You have no choice, thus you must do, and no otherwise. Whatever is not a duty, it is a sin. Human nature being radically corrupt, there is no redemption for anyone until human nature is killed within him. To one holding this theory of life, crushing out any of the human faculties, capabilities, and susceptibilities is no evil. Man needs no capacity but that of surrendering himself to the will of God, and if he uses any of his faculties for any other purpose but to do that supposed will more effectually, he is better without them. Mill goes on to write, but if it be any part of religion to believe that man was made by a good being, 
it is more consistent with that faith to believe that this being gave all human faculties that might be cultivated and unfolded, not rooted out and consumed, and that he takes delight in every nearer approach made by his creatures to the ideal conception embodied in them. Every increase in any of their capabilities of comprehension, of action, or of enjoyment. There is a different type of human excellence than the Calvinistic, a conception of humanity as having its nature bestowed on it for other purposes than merely to be abnegated. Curiously, whoops, oh my, sorry, I tried to make something go away and went all the way back to the top. Um, curiously, this is consistent with the view adopted by Seventh-day Adventists, a movement that later grew up in the United States. Ellen White wrote in Gospel Workers, men have the power to quench the Spirit of God. The power of choosing is left with them. They are allowed freedom of action. They may be obedient through the name and grace of our Redeemer, or they may be disobedient and realize the consequences. I don't know about you, but I find it remarkable that a relatively poorly educated young woman would take this view, a view that was contrary to the religious teachings of the mainstream denominations from which the early Adventists drew their members. It is evidence, I believe, of how God used her to guide our young church. Back to truths about how our universe is governed and why. Truths about the nature of God that had been revealed in scripture, truths that had been understood throughout much of church history, but that had somehow been misunderstood in the Protestant Reformation. René Descartes, a 16th century English-French philosopher and mathematician who spent a large share of his life in the Dutch Republic after serving in the armed forces of the Prince of Orange, had this to say. I recognize that the power of will which I have received from God is not of itself the source of my errors, for it is very ample and very perfect of its kind, any more than the, is the power of understanding. He ends his meditation by writing, For as often as I so restrain my will within the limits of my knowledge, it, is, it forms no judgment except on matters which are clearly and distinctly represented to it by my understanding. I cannot be deceived. In other words, we need to study scripture and base our beliefs on our understanding. This is the position taken by Graham Maxwell, who influenced my understanding, and who often paraphrased, paraphrased Ellen White, who said, God does not ask us to believe anything for which he does not provide adequate evidence, and it is evidence that appeals to the reason. In order to make this perhaps even more relevant to today, recently Thomas Friedman wrote an opinion column for the New York Times titled, Two codes your kids need to know. These are two things that the college board believes are keys to success in college and in life. One of them was the United States Constitution and various related documents. He quoted David Coleman, president of the college board, and Stephanie Sanford, its chief of global, global policy, in a joint statement saying, the Constitution forms the foundational code that gives shape to America and defines our essential liberties, our freedoms. It is the indispensable guide to our lives as productive citizens. Sanford is further quoted as saying, think of how much more ready you are to participate in college and society with, a, with an understanding of the five freedoms that the First Amendment protects. Of speech, assembly, 
Petition, Press, and Religion. The First Amendment lays the foundation for a mature community of conversation and ideas. Built on the right and even the obligation to speak up and, when needed, to protest, but not to interrupt and prevent others from speaking. I believe that free will and freedom are cornerstones of God's government as much as they are of earthly governments. I believe God has chosen to rule a universe where worship is freely given, not coerced. He prefers transparency. He prefers to persuade rather than command. We humans live in an imperfect community that has caused us damage, just as occurs when children live in an environment that is abusive or violent. But it doesn't end there. God offers to heal the damage. He offers us grace, a pardon that we don't earn or deserve, the graciousness to offer that he will never throw our failings in our face. He will treat us as if we had never fallen. Grace is a gift available to all. God offers a way back. He offers to heal the damage. And following that example, healthy living, health education, and health care have always been at the center of Seventh-day Adventist identity and mission. Finally, God calls on us to treat others as we wish to be treated, to be gracious to others. The decision is ours. We can decide we do not want to live under God's government. We can refuse the gift of grace and we will be abandoned to our own desires. We will suffer the death Christ suffered, not death by crucifixion, but death by separation from God. We will not live with him, but then we wouldn't be happy there. We would be persona non grata, a person without grace, in the midst of grace, and we would be miserable. The choice is ours. I hope to make wise decisions and live my life in a way that would make me welcome in such company. And I invite you to do the same. Our closing song is number 606, Once to Every Man and Nation. Yeah, but
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.